All righty. Welcome back for another episode of Two Plain Sports. Today, Sunday, October 2nd. Uh, not a great day yesterday, um, obviously. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that's got, that have some opinions that they like to voice, and we definitely have some thoughts and opinions on this past game uh, that the Sooners ended up dropping to TCU. Uh, so we're going to talk about that, and we're going to also recap uh, the weekend of bets between Jose and I and see and update the standings and see how we did. Um, but that's going to be the show. And I feel like we've got a lot to talk about with the game yesterday and um, not a great start. But before we get into it, I just want to say we appreciate it. Um, you know, we're, well, we were 5,100 subscribers. We've dropped below 5,100 subscribers. I think a few of you have been upset the way that OU has been playing and the way we've been talking about OU and hyping them up. And I think a few of you are unsubscribing. That's fine. Uh, but if you're new here, we're going to, you know, through wins and losses, we're going to continue to post videos because we're ultimately all Oklahoma fans. So hit the subscribe button, like the video, turn the notification bell on, and um, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Everything's linked in the description below. Also, if you're listening to us on Apple or Spotify, uh, leave us a review on there. You can follow us there as well. And uh, be sure to check out our channel membership if you'd like to help support us. If not, no big deal. Just like the video and comment on the video. Those help out a boatload with these videos. All right. So OU obviously um, coming off a loss to Kansas State, went down to Fort Worth and ended up dropping it, dropping another game to TCU 55-24. Uh, this one was a lot more uh, ugly than the Kansas State loss, which I didn't even think was really even possible. Um, just overall a horrendous game. Um Jose, what's your, what are some of your thoughts? Let, let's get this. Let's get started on it. I mean, they looked terrible. Like, I I woke up yesterday excited. You know, we we both talked about the game all last week, and going into the the betting for the weekend, I I mentioned like I I didn't know where to go because it could be either super close or a blowout. I didn't think it'd be a TCU blowout in the favor of TCU. Um, I honestly thought that the, the defense would come back and have made some adjustments. One of the biggest things I noticed is that linebackers in the cheetah position have the their back turned to the ball a lot whenever the, the snap whenever the ball is snapped. You'll see them come up to the line, show a blitz, and then they'll back off. They're not backpedaling. For the most part, they are turning their back to the ball, which makes it super easy for the quarterback to just either take a quick, get a quick uh, dump off to a short route, especially whenever it's a third, you know, a short yardage situation just to get a first down, which we saw a lot yesterday. And Justin Harrington, he made one good play, but outside of that, I think there's a reason why it's Broyles and Bowman at the safety positions. I know going into the year, Brandon was super high on Key Lawrence and there was, and a lot of people were, and I don't think it was without evidence that he's a good football player. He is, but he is slow when you compare him to even Justin Broyles and Justin Broyles isn't the fastest. As soon as Billy Bowman was out, that defense pretty much went to shambles. Billy Bowman to me showed to be like the best player on the defense. Danny Sussman did okay. I don't think really any of the linebackers were amazing. Deshaun White, a lot of bad, bad plays. Oguigbu still looks extremely slow. I just, and I, I've said it for two weeks now, there, there's no reason why Canick shouldn't be getting more playing time for the defense. He's fast and naturally talented enough. If he makes mistakes, at least you can be like, all right, it's the inexperience. He's a freshman. It'll get cleaned up with air, you know, as he's learning from the mistakes playing real football, not just in practice. Deshaun White and Ogwegby were making the exact same mistakes that Jaron Kanick may make, but they're experienced. Like, it's inexcusable at this point, and they're just making the defense look worse. The defensive line, they looked amazing. Weeks one through three, can't get any pressure on, on the quarterback, can't really stop a run. Defense looks, looks terrible. And then for everyone – because I was keeping up on Twitter as angry as I was about this game, because I was yelling quite a bit at the television. Um, people were ready to 
fire Brent Venables to, I saw like halfway at the end of the first quarter, there were already people on Twitter saying, why don't we just bring in uh, Davis Bevel in? Let's give him a chance because they're frustrated with Dylan Gabriel's misses. And um, criticizing the offensive line. The offensive line, was it their best game? No, but it wasn't terrible. Like the quarterback had time and they were opening up plenty of holes for the for the running backs. A couple of good things that I took away from it is one, Javante Barnes is a dude. And we've been hyping him up, maybe without without real evidence behind it. But I think that yesterday he showed that with a little bit more playing time, he can be very good. He runs really violently he has a big explosion whenever he's when he finds a hole he takes it and goes and I really think and we mentioned it at the when we, we talked about this team in preseason Marcus Major's biggest thing was his availability and through the first four weeks he was there and he made big plays for Oklahoma and I don't think that's going to change when he does be get to come back but yesterday's game gave Javante Barnes an opening to take snaps away from him if Eric Gray's hurt for next game, for the Texas game, then it would be a Javante Bar. I think Javante Barnes leads the running back group with Marcus Major coming in his same role that he's had with it with Eric Gray. I mean, I really hope we see Jaron Kanick. I, I don't think there's a reason to hold back the freshman players. Jaden Gibson shouldn't have dropped that pass at the beginning of the game. I think that was a huge momentum killer for the offense. Still in Gabriel to talk about the quarterback again. It just shows a big drop off. If Dylan Gabriel's not available, please put Nick Evers in. Like Dave, you you didn't trust Davis Bevel enough to even throw dump off routes. It was running the ball, and he would even miss those short passes. Like it wasn't very good. And we talked about it when he transferred. He wasn't the best quarterback that transferred in. It was Dylan Gabriel. General Booty, I think, was better. Even though he did come from JUCO, he was the leading passer in regards to yards and at the JUCO level. And then you have a four-star freshman quarterback. Give General Booty or Nick Evers a shot next game if Dylan Gabriel's not available. If Dylan Gabriel's available, he is our best option. As much as people don't like it, it's true. And he's he is inaccurate, and RG3 talked about it a lot at the beginning of the game when he was having those accuracy problems. He just is trying to really put a lot of zip behind the ball and it's throwing off his accuracy from the way that RG three talked about it. He was coached by Levy. It's not something that Levy coaches. It's just a bad habit that Dylan has that needs to get coached out of him. You, you bring up a lot of good points and uh, we can start with Dylan Gabriel and, and, Part of that broadcast, RG3 was talking about why he's probably missing a lot of these. Not only is he trying to, you know, basically Randy Johnson every throw and try to throw it as hard as he can, he is, his feet, his feet are just not being set. He's like, a, it's like a baseball stance, like a, a shortstop running and, and just sprinting and, you know, throwing everything in into the behind the ball you can. Um, he's not standing straight up. He's, he's just, opening his feet way too wide and rg3 talked about that coach levy teaches you to keep the feet right under you so you can stand up tall and and i think this is part of part of the deal is it's tough to really so levy coached him for a few years right but levy left and the quality of coaching probably wasn't as good as what he was getting initially with coach levy and then those bad habits probably started forming and it's tough to coach something out of a quarterback that's been, you know, doing it for a couple of years within a couple, you know, within a few months. I mean, he transferred in and they have limited time that they can practice. They have limited time. They can meet limited everything to, you know, protect the players ultimately, but you're just running through a crash course of everything, trying to coach them. And it's just, there's just not enough time. And there is a clear drop off. I don't think Davis Bevel is the second best quarterback on this roster. I just don't. And I think general booty is better. And I think Nick Evers is better too. Booty or Bevel looked uncomfortable. He looked like he was overwhelmed. Um, I don't know. So, but there is a clear drop off and I'm not going to say that Dylan Gabriel is perfect because he's not. Um, I think he's a little, 
he's playing scared. He was playing scared to not make, he's just been playing not to make a mistake. He's throwing balls where only his guys can catch every single time. And he's missing guys that are wide open. Um, I don't think it's Jeff Levy's fault. Uh, I don't think it's the offensive side of the ball. I, other than the fact that they just need more time and Dylan Gabriel will most likely be coming back next year. Um, you know, with this performance so far, I don't see him being a top NFL draft pick. So I see him coming back next year and Jackson Arnold coming to sit behind him. Uh, I don't think Jackson Arnold can come in and start over Dylan Gabriel. Um, so we're, we're in this for the long haul for the rest of this year and next year. And hopefully he can play for Red River because that's going to be interesting, especially if Quinn Ewers is back for Texas. So, and that hit, that hit was pretty darn dirty. Um, you know, I mean, I, I get that it's, you know, it's, he, he wasn't doing it on purpose or anything like that. It just, it's, it's, it's a tough look and I hope Dylan's good. I'm sure he's fine. It's just going to take a week or two probably for him to be back to a hundred percent. And I hope, I hope it's a week. Uh, we just don't need another two attack of Iloa. So if he needs to miss um, next week's game, it is what it is. I mean, OU's already lost twice. And I think we're going to see a shift in the mindset of this staff because you already have two losses. You're Owen two in big 12 play. Why not let the young kids start to play more? Um, I agree with you. Why, why now it's like, well, we're not competing for a college football playoffs. We got to look, you know, next year and the year after, why not give these younger guys some more opportunities? So, yeah, I'd like to see Jaron Kanick play because it's the linebackers are apparent. They, they freeze. They're not as fast. They're not, they're not quick enough. And it's tough. It's a tough look. Um, so obviously we talked about the quarterback being, if Dylan Gabriel gets hurt, this, we were talking about this before the season even started, if he got hurt, it'd be detrimental to this team. Horrible. Same thing with the safety position on this defense. It was so razor thin coming in this year. If Billy Bowman got hurt or if Royals or, or someone, you know, the other starter gets hurt, the depth behind them is not that great. And it was very apparent yesterday. And as soon as Bowman went out, you could tell that it was rough. Um, I don't know. What, what do you think? I mean, Billy Bowman is, is the quarterback of this defense. I know that he, you know, Venables wants the linebacker position to be the quarterback, but it seemed like Billy Bowman was the most important piece in this whole defense. Yeah. He's seems like he's the one that's picked up the defense the quickest because you never really see him out of position. Does he make mistakes? Yeah, but they're not mistakes that are costing the team a lot because his athleticism lets him make up for for those minor mis- mental errors from what we've seen, right, through the first four weeks and rough you know, few minutes that he was in the game yesterday. The It is a huge drop. Off. Harrington is not meant to be playing safety. It seemed like every mistake that he made, he would leave a player wide open. There was no one in sight. It's because he needed to back up and play the safety spot. But he's, in his mind, it seemed like he was still the cheetah in the defense while Deshaun White was on the field. So the essential was, and even though we were supposed to have him in the safety and back up, we had two cheetahs playing the short routes. I, that's just not stuff that can happen. I mean, give Robert Spears Jennings a shot. Give Jordan Mukes a shot. Give Jordan Rowe, uh, Jaden Rowe a shot. Um, I mean, there you you ha- it, the thing is, there's young players. This team, and it's like I said with, with the linebackers, there's experience on this team, but the experience isn't playing well enough, and to to say that the freshmen aren't there mentally yet, because neither are the the more senior players. They're not. We we're watching it in front of our eyes. They're not ready. They they don't understand this defense. Should they at this point? Yes, they should have the experience and the knowledge to have picked up a lot quicker than they are picking it up. If you have a young team, it doesn't look as bad like with these losses because, again, you can say, well, most of this team is freshman, sophomore players. Give them one more year to learn the defense, to make the mistakes on the field, and they will look night and day. This year, and it seems, and I was thinking about this, and I don't, maybe not to the same degree, is going to kind of be like last year's, te- uh, last year's Texas, going to look shitty, a lot, 
But with this recruiting class that's coming in, it should turn around. Hopefully next year we'll see a lot of this recruiting class. And I actually disagree with, with the quarterback position. If Dylan Gabriel comes back, which I do agree with you, it seems like he should. If he has aspirations to go in the NFL, you can't really you can't transfer anymore without losing a year of eligibility. He should. I think Jackson Arnold will still push him for time. I think Jackson Arnold has the the talent to at least push for reps in practice and even threaten for the starting position. Will he do it? No. And which is weird for me to say because you and Brandon were we're big on Jackson Arnold's going to be the starter next year if Dylan Gabriel leaves, no matter what. I was because to me, it's still a freshman is tough for a freshman to be successful no matter what position, and especially the quarterback, because it's a lot of between the ear stuff. But talent wise, man, like Dylan Gabriel is the best, and it's not great. And I think Jackson Arnold is more talented and has better accuracy. If he throw if if Jackson Arnold comes in, can be the starter and throw 25 touchdowns and 15 picks, I'd be content with that as a true freshman. Not a bad, like not a great year, definitely not a great year, but not terrible. Just makes a lot of mistakes, but that can that hopefully get cleaned up by Levy. Talk about it, Levy, his play calling yesterday. I think everyone, even Venables, they're playing to not make mistakes. It, they all look super tense. Like, and they were talking about it on the broadcast, and I was thinking about it leading up to the game. Ven- the Venables we've all look kind of loved over his career is that fiery dude that needs to get back coach that is always yelling at the refs, yelling at the players, making adjustments on the fly. That's not what we're seeing. And yeah, being a head coach is a different responsibility because you need to navigate the entire team and not just one side of the ball. But on the defensive side of the ball, I think he, for the rest of the year, he should consider taking over play calling responsibilities, even if it is just for this year. Because I don't know what it is, but Ted Roof as a play caller, not amazing on the defensive side. And Levy as a play caller hasn't shown to be what Levy has been on paper that can what that can put a top 15 offense on the field a lot of the plays are lateral to or parallel to the line of scrimmage nothing really very very few go upfield unless they're either they're if they're running plays in the interior you know obviously they only have one way to go but even passes it seems like it's way too much way too much stuff along the line of scrimmage that doesn't get enough yards like they're, they're not trying to get the first down they're just they're trying to be methodical and trying to keep the ball with uh, in their possession as long as possible. And it's just not working out. Dylan's inaccuracy is definitely not helping out, but the play calling hasn't been amazing either. Well, and I would kind of come to the defense with Levy on Levy because I think I remember yesterday before, before Gabriel went out, I think there were five throws that he missed that. I mean, Drake Stoops was wide open. I mean, it was blatantly just because he was wide open. It's just the pass wasn't getting there. Part of me wonders if Lebby knows this. Obviously, he's aware of it, of course. But he's calling more conservative for the easy throws for Dylan to be able to hit to get his confidence. Because I don't know. This whole team looks like it's lacking confidence now. Like no one, no one's just going out there and just playing, you know, just going out all out and going after it. Like they were playing against Nebraska. Those guys... That, that's a total different team and not saying that Nebraska is good by any means, but if this team, what, what we have seen the past two weeks went and played in Nebraska next weekend, it would not be the same and saying, you know, everyone, no injuries or anything like that. The way that the confidence level is zero and half the battle is getting their confidence up. Scott Frost might've been the only thing keeping that team together. Because they've looked yeah. worse every week since that game. Oh, I know. I know. I'm not saying that OU wouldn't beat them. I, I think they would. But, yeah, it's going horrible in Nebraska. Bad. Yeah. Worse than us. <laughs> worse than us. Yeah. I mean, you know, and also, you got to think long term. I mean, there's – OU lost a lot of talent as or the best talent, you know, that they had and it wasn't the greatest, you know, along the offense and defensive line. 
brand new offense and defensive schemes. And, you know, you lose a Heisman quarterback, potential Heisman winner quarterback. It's tough to have these expectations. And it's somewhat not fair to Dylan Gabriel that OU has had, you know, back-to-back Heismans and Jalen Hurts and then, you know, Rattler slash Caleb Williams. And then you expect, you come, you grow to expect that Dylan Gabriel, okay, well, you're at Oklahoma. You, you should be in the Heisman, um, you know, list. You should be one of the finalists or, or at least be talked about. And it's, there are lofty expectations for someone that's coming from Central Florida and someone that's coming off of a, an injury. Um, I don't know, this whole team has just lost their confidence, lost their edge. And I do think that there's something to say about Ted Roof. Um, I will defend Levy just because I feel like, you know, he, he knows that there's issues. But Ted Roof, I just feel like it's just the play calling is just not there. I'm not saying that the talent is there either. So to some degree, it isn't totally his fault. And they inherited kind of a, a rough looking defense to begin with. But there's just times where these guys are are not getting any pressure and yet you're still blitzing and blitzing and blitzing and guys are getting toasted left and right. And it's like, well, at some point you just have to drop more guys into coverage and at least try to keep things in front of you. I understand being aggressive, but I mean, it was brutal. And there's a reason why, and I'm not saying to fire Ted Roof or anything. I just think everyone's going through a transition, but Ted Roof has had a lot of stops recently and they're, they're only one or two years. And it hasn't been very long. I mean, you go from a, like a defensive analyst to a play calling role from Clemson to this, to Oklahoma in one year. And I know Venables wants someone that with experience and very, you know, all that stuff. I just, I don't know what I'm hoping for now is I want the younger guys. I want this team to play like we've got nothing to lose because they've got nothing to lose. You literally have not, you have no expectations. Now you're not ranked in the AP top 25. You already have two losses. You're not going to the playoffs. Just go play. I want to see the younger guys. Probably not going to compete for the Big 12 championship. No, probably not. And so just go out there and ruin people's seasons. Go beat Texas. Go beat Oklahoma State. Go beat the, the contenders for the Big 12 and just ruin seasons. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain and get some momentum going. I just, I think this team needs a hard reset. And I don't know how you get the mentality to change. Like I thought that, um, you know, it felt like Venables had somewhat changed it uh, coming in. But, you know, also building a culture at a program is not is not 10 months. It is not 10 months worth of time. A lot of these guys have been here three, four, and five years. And the old culture is still around. As these guys graduate and these young kids come in and these young classes come in, All they will know is the Venables culture Mm -hmm. and you'll be able to get rid of what's, you know, what's still remaining and some of the mindsets and the logic and things like that. Not that the guys are bad or anything. I'm not saying that, but you finally get your guys in if you're Venables. And I think that makes a big difference because you look at like a perfect example is Florida state, Mike Norvell, while they did lose this past weekend, they, they are looking a lot better than what they have. And it, because he's got his guys in, he's changed the culture. It takes a while and it's not a one year deal. And I, I understand the expectations being at Oklahoma, just sometimes you have to be realistic with things. Yeah. And I think you can point to a lot of examples of year one with a new head coach doesn't work out a lot more often than it does. Nick Saban, not a great first year at Alabama then went on to win a national championship. I don't think it would be fair to have those same expectations for for Brent Venables, but definitely having an expectation of better than this year is correct. Like you can't, you can't go into next year and be like, all right, we just, we can, we have to perform at least to the same standard as last year. No, we have to perform big 12 championship or bust at least. Uh, Sark recency, you know, recently went five and seven last year. If Quinn Ewer didn't get hurt, I think it's fair to say that they might be undefeated or have a one a one loss under their belt. Like they are very with Quinn Ewers, they were a very good team. And I think that again points back to letting your young players play, letting them make the mistakes, 
you know, year one. So that year two, <clears throat> it's a lot of cleanup. I mean, you can, you have a lot of tape that you can show them where they made the mistake and they, they can, you know, recall what happened on the field and walk through it with them. Because right now there's zero tape on Jaron. There's one half of football of tape that Jaron Canick can study of himself and that a coach can work with him on outside of practice and practice is valuable, but game real game experience is nothing to practice. It's, it's not, it's totally different. Right. So they have to, you just have to let these guys, these young guys play like, and again, hopefully Billy Bowman can come back for next week. Cause if he can't, we're going to get shredded, especially if Quinn years does come back, it's going to be a tough look corners still look like shit. Um, Jade, but I think last week, against TCU was very much just a size difference. Yeah. And we talked about it in the pregame in the preview last week. They're they're huge. Their shortest receiver is the same size as our corner. It is 5'11, 5'10. And then they all go on to be 6'3, 6'4, 6'5. We even whenever they played decent coverage, those guys just had to get the ball a little little higher. Like Doug just had to put it up and then they can put their arms out and the corner has zero shot at getting it. Like it's getting bit the, the recruiting class, I think does make a huge difference because the corners coming in uh, outside of uh, Josiah Wagner, Jacoby, uh, I think is six, one, uh, Macari Vickers, six, six feet, six, one, like an inch or two is a significant difference. And especially with uh wingspan, if you can, if you have, you know, a couple inches on uh, added to your wingspan, that can get the ball knocked out of the receiver's hand. You can wrap it around a little easier when you're trying to um, compete for the ball on a deep route. Like it's there, there's definitely something to say with the corners. Woody Washington didn't look amazing. Not his best game. Hopefully he can recover next week. I think there's a, there's just too much to clean up for realistically Oklahoma fans to expect to somehow win out and go 10 and two. But I think a realistic record is still eight and four, even nine and three, like if they can somehow pull it out of their asses. But eight and four, I think would be the more realistic end of year schedule, uh, you know, win total. Yeah. And just Ty Wagner's five foot 11. I'm, I wanted to look it up just to, just to confirm Makari Vickers six one, Jacoby Johnson six three. So they're bigger. Um, I want everyone to also remember that the first year that Bob Stoops was the head coach at Oklahoma in 1999, OU went seven and five, seven and five. And then the next year, obviously they won a national championship. Not saying that that's what's going to happen to rent Venables and the staff. Obviously it would be amazing, but when you come in first year, it's not great. And like you mentioned, Nick Saban wasn't great. You know, the first year, I mean, it takes a while to really turn everything around and you get these recruits in and it just, it's patience. And I just want to see the young guys play now. I mean, yeah, you, obviously you're going to play some of the veterans and things like that, but get some playing time for these young guys that haven't seen the field yet. I don't know why, you know, unless the only thing I could see is you don't want them to fall into bad habits um, and things like that of like the, you know, just losing their confidence. I, I don't know, but I think just getting them out there just to play. And I know you want, I know they're trying to redshirt probably some of the kids, but um, you know, just get them out there and, and get, get them on the field, uh, get, at least get them in the rotation. But, you know, we got to step back and remember that it's a lot to expect OU to go 10 and two um, or 11 and one or 12 and zero. you know, I, I think I said at the beginning of the season where prediction was 10 and two. I, I don't, I don't still believe that. Um, I thought it was realistic before the season started just because of the talent. Um, I do agree eight and four is the most realistic expectation. Nine and three, maybe if Dylan Gabriel's back next week and it's a rivalry game next week, crazier things have happened. And it's not like Texas. It's been perfect, you know, smooth sailing for them either. Um, you know, was, but unless Quinn Ewers comes back, it could be, it could be interesting. So we have to keep our expectations in line. And I also want to talk about, well, are we going to lose some recruits because of this performance? And, you know, this two-week stretch. Listen, I, don't, I am not concerned about OU losing any recruits unless they lose every single one of these games the rest of the year. If OU goes like four and eight, okay, I, I, I'm going to start to become concerned. But I think a lot of these kids know that 
there was a lot of talent that left this team. There's a lot of talent deficiencies on this, you know, on this, in this program. And they know that the playing time is there because obviously they can tell that it's not going great. And if all these kids do decide to leave, where are they going to go? Yeah, there might be a few guys here and there that can go find different homes. At this point, a lot of the top programs already have a pretty full recruiting class. And, you know, they don't have scholarships to give out. Yeah, now could someone find a spot for a Macari Vickers? Probably. You know, there's a couple guys that are ex exceptions to this. But, you know, David Hicks just committed to Texas A&M. Did Texas A&M look great yesterday? No. Are they, are they going to lose the number one defensive lineman and the number one linebacker? No. So I think everyone needs to calm down about, well, OU's now going to start losing recruits. OU's going down. You know, the, the world is ending. I remember back in late November, early December, when people thought OU was going to be irrelevant forever after Lincoln Riley left. And now the expectations were to go to the national championship this year. Now the world's on fire and everything's in it. Just take the longer picture. It's fine if OU loses a couple more. We got nothing to lose and everything to gain as far as ruining people's seasons and getting these young guys some playing time. And I think OU's going to still recruit strong and close out this season good. And I think they're going to close out this recruiting, recruiting class, and I'm still convinced going to be a top five. I think five through seven is, is not unreasonable to expect. I still think they could land to Celia Kana. And I think they're going to sell it even harder on the safeties, be like, listen, we literally need you. You can step in and start up opposite of Billy Bowman. You know, Ryan Yates, get in here. Marvin Burks, get in here. Peyton Bowen. Okay, you're picking between Texas a and Oklahoma. Both haven't looked great. You can play for us. I mean, I, I'm just not, I'm not convinced that OU is going to lose. You know, we're going to be losing kids left and right. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, and you you brought up, I mean, the the David Hicks example is is the most recent one that people will can point at. And last week, whenever he committed to A and M, you know, people were pissed. You know, saying the A and M uh bag man you know gave him four million four million for his commitment whatever who cares if o oklahoma needs to start getting into that game to pay try to get as much money to as a and is, is paying their recruits it's part of recruiting now and people can say oh it's ruining college football things change things change all the time and it was just happening behind closed doors before now it's out in the open and everyone knows about it and just join in if you can't beat them, join them. It's time to join. Oklahoma is not going to lose that many recruits. If if we lose one or two, not a huge deal, but I don't even expect that to happen because of the way that Venables recruits has recruited for this class. It's been a very open, from, from our understanding, been very open communication. He's even said, like, the, the, the don't commit until you're 100% sure that Oklahoma is a place for you, I think, is why that mo most of them – you've seen on social media have, you know, Dale and Smothers that trust, trust and BV hashtag. A lot of them went to Twitter and like, we're saying like, don't worry. Like we're, we're, you know, for, we're going to be there no matter what a hundred percent. Like we're fine. It's foolish to think that just because a team lost, and this is just any team, not Oklahoma specifically. And you can point to like all of, all of the teams that currently have a top 10 class outside of Alabama. I mean, Clemson, I think, have two losses on their record. Or most of them do. Oklahoma Georgia, does. Georgia doesn't. Texas, oh, Georgia doesn't. Oklahoma does. Or Ohio State doesn't. I think, okay, so five through ten. Oklahoma does. Texas does. Uh, Notre, Notre Dame. Notre Dame. My, does Miami have two? They do. They lost to AM and in Middle Tennessee. Miami. Does Tennessee, Tennessee have two? No, Tennessee doesn't have two losses. All right. But anyways, four out of the ten, let's just that we just named off of the, the top of our heads without doing too much research on that. Four out of the ten have two losses on their record. And none of you guys as college football fans expect all of their players to decommit tomorrow. Like you just you're 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 overreacting to a very bad performance, which is fair. It was a terrible performance. But yeah, like Brum said, unless we're like a four and eight squad really don't expect that to happen no it's 
And yeah, for the most part, a lot of them, it would be tough for a lot of them to find a new place to commit to. I think that is a realistic view. A lot of, you know, the top 100 kids, the fringe top 100 players, if they decommitted, probably would find a new home pretty easily. For the other guys, it'd be tougher, but definitely could. Um, maybe just not as big of a program, when I think is a fair thing to say at this at this point in the recruitment cycle. But it, I think the bad performances can still be a selling point. That is what recruiting is, is trying to sell this image, right? Bad performances you can you can show like all right, Jack for Jackson Arnold, for example. Look how look how the quarterback position has looked behind Dylan Gabriel. No one's really there to fill in that talent gap right now. You can be that guy to fill it in as a backup if he does get hurt, or you can compete with him if you can show better accuracy and learn the playbook. If because he is expected to be an early enrollee for the linemen, some of the offensive linemen will be gone after this year. And others are just talented enough that they can get some of the young guys that are coming in could beat them out. Anton Harrison, not expected to be back. Kane Green could come in and compete. I think day one for that starting position, PJ out of war, Colton Vasek could compete for some, for some playing time because after Reggie Grimes and Ethan Downs, I don't think Marcus Stripling is the answer behind those guys. Jonah Lualu hasn't been amazing either. You can come in and compete for playing time. All of those guys in the 23 recruiting class can and will compete for playing time, assuming that because most of them, from what we've learned from the interviews, from the conversations we've had, will be early enrollees and will have built up a foundation in college football before the football season starts next year. And also, oh, you could still go get to Celia Kana. Um, you know, and I still feel pretty strong about Tecilia Kana. Um, I know OU's competing with Texas. Well, also, we got to remember, Texas has had top five and top 10 recruiting classes for years, and they continue to put a poor product out there. It's fine. I mean, and they kept they kept getting those top recruiting classes. It just was mo more dysfunction in the coaching and, and the athletic director and that type of stuff that just wasn't fostering a good team. So bad teams can land great recruiting classes because you see an opportunity as yourself in high school. It's extremely hard to go undefeated in, in this college football, in this era. I mean, it's a, there's a lot of parity. There's a lot of great coaching out there. And, you know, there's only so many spots that like in Alabama that go undefeated or Georgia or somewhere like that. You have an opportunity to go play at Oklahoma. Oklahoma is on the same level as them as far as a brand and – just need the talent to be coached up. And so I'm not concerned at all. Um, I think that Peyton Bowen is still um, there for OU. Ryan Yates is still there for OU. Like as far as, as being, you know, serious contenders in this recruitment, not saying that OU is going to close them out, but I just, I think we have to take a step back and think about the long picture. And I think overall this, this program is, is just fine. And people calling for Brent Venable's job, and all this other stuff is ridiculous because who are you going to go hire? I mean, really, who, who's going to be better? No one. I mean, he's bought into the program. He's looking long-term. They're making investments facility-wise. They're making the transition in the SEC. He's recruiting at a high level. Yeah, he lost two defensive linemen back-to-back. -back, but he also has 22 commits already. And he's probably going to land a few more. I think OU is also going to look at the transfer portal. Um, this offseason to infuse some veteran talent and some uh, much needed depth el elsewhere, like along the tight end position. I could see the offensive line, the defensive line uh, being a, you know, looking at the transfer portal. Could they go get a Johnny Bowens? It's, it's going to be fine. They're go there's going to blend young talent with veteran talent and another year in the, in the program. It's going to be fun. I just, I think everyone needs to take a deep breath. And for the most part, the transfers haven't played a lot like Trey Morrison. The few opportunities he's had has made plays. And to, just to talk about the play he made it yesterday. Was it a little early down the, on the ball? Yeah. I don't, I, I don't think that his play when he smoked the receiver was a dirty play. I think he was, it was early and could have definitely been a flag. I also don't think that the linebackers hit on Dylan Gabriel was a dirty hit. I think he just, 
was already in the motion of going to hit Dylan and Dylan slid at the same time. And it was just an unfortunate situation. And again, we hope Dylan's fine and can play next week, but a lot of injuries, Trey Morrison should get more opportunities. CJ Golden hasn't really been out on the field a lot. Can I Walker? I don't really remember being on the field too much, but honestly, I was kind of blurred. My vision was blurred with anger after like the first quarter and a half. So he might've been out there, but, uh, I, I you just got to give more guys the, those transfers like you brought them in for a reason but you're playing the same guys that were playing last year when getting the exact same result like throw you gotta you gotta try something new and I know these coaches weren't here last year but they're not I would expect especially Brett Venables and Todd Bates like they they would have at least studied a little bit of Oklahoma to know what they got themselves into and I'm assuming that every coach did, they know what was happening last year and they would, they know what their image is for the future, but you're putting the exact same guys out there in the exact same position and they're making the exact same mistakes. Like you're just yeah, same shit, different day. But could there be, could it be that the transfers aren't catching on as quickly? I don't know. You know, it's just, there's, it could be a two way street. I don't know. It's, it's, it is interesting because, yeah, you're right. The transfers aren't playing a whole lot. And outside of McCabe Met Tower uh, has played quite a bit, obviously. But, um, you know, it is what it is. I mean, I'm, I'm curious to see. I'm sure people have been commenting at this point on this video and some of the points that we've been talking about and everything else. But I think that's enough to talk about this team and this program. Uh, do you have any thoughts before we move on to talk about our bets? Get Jaron Canick on the field for Texas. And get Javante Barnes the ball, especially if Dylan, even if Dylan Gabriel can play. Let Javante eat. Yeah, I agree. Um, and you never know what could happen. It's a Red River coming up this weekend. I mean, all bets are off at this point. It's a rivalry game. I don't care what anyone says, and I don't care what Vegas says. There's been times where Texas has been a train wreck and come in and beat Oklahoma. Uh, or vice versa so it, it it doesn't matter um so it should be a pretty good game this weekend um all right so we'll recap the betting uh from this weekend i had five bets jose had uh, eight bets jose would you like to go through yours and update the, your total record yep so i think my rec if i remember correctly and i really should have written this down i was 18 and 15 as of last week before last week, this this weekend's bets. This weekend, I went four and four, improving to twenty two and nineteen. You know, not, not amazing, but still winning. Uh, UCLA absolutely whooped on Washington. Uh, that one wasn't even close. Iowa was not able to cover. Uh, they weren't able to bring it close enough. I had them plus ten and a half. Lost that, and it was definitely not an under point total there was 41 and a half Oklahoma I even have it scratched out here you guys can see it I don't know it, I originally wrote down TCU plus six and a half but I didn't want to be the Debbie Downer Debbie Downer here so I took Oklahoma minus six and a half clearly took a big L on that one Alabama minus 17 they were able to pull away against Arkansas Rutgers plus 39 and a half. Thank God for the hook there because they only lost by 39. Uh, Oklahoma State money line whooped on Baylor and Kansas was able to uh, capitalize on the mistakes that Iowa State made and they won and I had that money line. All right. Well, going into this week, I was, um, I was, what was I? I can't even remember, but I know I'm 20 and 16 now. Uh, so what I was, I 16 and 15, that's what I was 20, 16 and 15 going into the week. I went four and one, uh, I'm now 20 and 16 overall. Uh, my one blemish, I took OU minus six and a half because I thought things would be corrected, but obviously I am wrong. Um, or I was wrong. Uh, Michigan, Iowa, I took Michigan minus 10 and a half Kentucky Ole Miss. I took Kentucky plus seven, uh, Oregon state versus Utah. I took Utah minus 10 and a half and they whooped up on Oregon state. And East Carolina, South Florida took East Carolina minus nine and East Carolina handled them comfortably. So I am 20 and 16 on the year. I am now 55.5% uh, so far in the season. Not too bad. I, all I want to be is 55, 60% right. 
if I can just continue, that's not a bad way to do it. So, um, but yeah, so I don't have anything else. Uh, do you? Don't think so. I was actually thinking about it real quick. A&M and Oklahoma are in the exact same position. And one of us has a first year head coach and the other one has a guy that's been there for like six years. So it could yeah. always be worse. It could be. And I think uh, Texas A&M is going to be most likely taking another loss this weekend because they've got Alabama this weekend. So Texas A&M might be three and three uh, at the end of could we, uh, but... next. Oh yeah, we could too. I mean, you know, it's, we might just crater with them and it's not like Texas a and is doing that great, but yeah, Jimbo's been there for a while. And, um, it's curious. I'm curious to see if they go eight and four again, does Jimbo's seat get a little warm Does David Hicks start second guessing? I don't know. Who knows? But, uh, I mean, that kind of segues to my end of, end of video. How do you feel about the team overall? <laughs> I really, it's shitty. Definitely not the expectations that we had. Cause I also thought it was talented enough to be 10 and two, but they just make way too many mistakes to compete to that level. Um, but I honestly think that there's no reason to worry in the long term. Look at AM. They absolutely stink. And that guy's been there for six years. And we're competing at the exact same level as them at this point. I uh, I think Oklahoma is fine in the long term. This year, pretty much a write-off. Eight and four, I think, is the best we're we're looking at here. Yep. Yeah. You never know. I mean, oh, you can turn it around. It is just two losses. There is a path for OU to, you know pull it all together. I don't see it necessarily happening overnight. Nine and three, eight and four is most likely. Um, so curious what people have to say. I'm sure there's going to be some passion on both sides and um, I'm curious to see. So if you made it this far, like the video, subscribe to the channel, turn the notification bell on. So, you know, when we post, because obviously we posted on Sunday for the first time in a long time and uh, be sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook and Apple and Spotify. Everything's linked in the description below. We'll see you guys next time.